بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد عليه أفضل الصلاة وأزكى التسليم In the third lecture of vision we are going to study the information processing in the retina the role of the lateral geniculate body and the visual cortex as well as the different types of ocular movements During this lecture, we have to know the concentric receptive field of bipolar cells and retinal ganglion cells. What is the role of ganglion cells? The visual pathway from the retina to the visual cortex. Role of the lateral geniculate body in vision. The process of information processing in the primary visual cortex. The parallel pathway to identify what and where, the motion analysis, and we have to know the difference between or the role of the inferior temporal cortex in face and object recognition. We have to identify the effect of lesions in the visual pathway, and lastly, the different types of ocular movements. After we studied the mechanism of stimulation of the photoreceptors, we have to understand how the information will be processed through the different layers of the retina. Photoreceptors by the glutamate they release are synapsing with the horizontal cells in the outer plexiform layer and with the bipolar cells. So the photoreceptors will transmit the signal to the horizontal cells and the bipolar cells. Horizontal cells located in the outer plexiform layer are going to transmit the signal horizontally and modulate the transmission of the signal between the photoreceptors and the bipolar cells. Bipolar cells in the inner nuclear layer are receiving the signals and transmitting it from the photoreceptors and horizontal cells to the ganglion cells or to the amacrine cells. While the amacrine cells in the inner plexiform layer are transmitting the signals in between bipolar cells and ganglion cells. Ganglion cell layer are the last layer and in the ganglion cells or in the axon of the ganglion cells the nerve impulse will be generated and will be conducted through the visual pathway to the lateral geniculate body. Synaptic interaction and the receptive field organization. The receptive field is the area in the retina when stimulated by light, it changes the membrane potential of the photoreceptor. So we can define the receptive field as the area in the retina when stimulated by light, it changes the membrane potential of photoreceptor. And the receptive field of an individual photoreceptor is usually circular. Is usually circular. And the light in the center of the surround field and dark in the surround of the receptive field make this receptive field formed of two parts, center and surround. Photoreceptors stimulated by light in the center of the receptive field produce hyperpolarization and a decrease in the release of glutamate, while the photoreceptor, the photoreceptor that detect the darkness in the surround of the receptive field produce depolarization or shows depolarization and usually they continue to release the glutamate. The receptive field of the photoreceptors and the retinal interneurons determine the receptive field of the retinal ganglion cells. The retinal ganglion cells, this means that these photoreceptors stimulated by light is going to produce depolarization of bipolar cells and consequently stimulation and increase the rate of the charge from the retinal ganglion cells. While the photoreceptors of the surround that detect darkness produce hyperpolarization of the bipolar cells and decrease in the rate of the charge from the ganglion cells. So 
the receptive field of photoreceptors and retinal interneuron determine the receptive field of the retinal ganglion cells and consequently their activity and consequently their activity. Suppose you have a flashlight and this flashlight can project a very small spotlight on the retina on the retina while you are monitoring the activity of the visual neurons while you are recording the activity from the ganglion cells so you are moving the flashlight and try to record the ganglion cell activity and this flash of light would change the firing rate of the neuron this flashlight would change the firing rate of the ganglion cells and has no effect outside this area this means that this flashlight is going to change the activity of the ganglion cells stimulated at this area and has no effect on the surrounding part of the retina so the receptive field is formed of center stimulated and surround without any effect so the characteristics of the receptive field of the retinal ganglion cells constitute an important step in the visual information processing because the ganglion cells are going to generate the action potential and conduct this action potential to the visual cortex through the optic nerve so the information about the visual events are carried to the brain by the activity or from the activity of the ganglion cells so if the center of the if the center photoreceptors are stimulated and they are going to excite the ganglion cells and bipolar cells we mention this as on center on center ganglion cells or on center bipolar cells and if the surround photoreceptors inhibit the bipolar cells we mention this as off surround so in this receptive field we have something which is called on center of surround this means that the photoreceptors located in the center stimulates the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells while the photoreceptors in the surround is inhibiting or produce inhibitory input to the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells and vice versa if the central photoreceptors or the photoreceptors located in the center of the receptive field inhibits the bipolar cells and ganglion cells it is named as off center and if the peripheral or the surround photoreceptors produce stimulation of the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells that is named as on surround so the receptive field is formed of center and surround if the center photoreceptors excites the bipolar cells and ganglion cells we name it as on center if the surround is producing inhibitory effect this is known as off surround and vice versa so now we will know how the photoreceptors located in the center and the photoreceptors located in the periphery affect the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells the connection between the photoreceptor in the center of the receptive field and the photoreceptors in the surround of the photo of the receptive field can affect the bipolar cells and ganglion cells can affect the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells In this slide, we are going to understand the processing of signals from the photoreceptors by different retinal cells. The processing of signals from the photoreceptors by different retinal cells. The receptive field of the photoreceptors and their connection. The receptive field of the photoreceptors and their connection. We have here a group of photoreceptors that's, that are distributed in between receptive field center and receptive field surround these two types of photoreceptors are synapsing with one bipolar cell named as the on center bipolar cell the photoreceptors located in the center of the receptive field are going to discharge directly to the bipolar cells are going to transmit their input or provide direct input to the bipolar cells while the photoreceptors located in the receptive field surround are transmitting or providing the input to the bipolar cells indirectly via horizontal cells the horizontal cells transmits the signals from the photoreceptors of the receptive field surround 
to the bipolar cells and if we look here to the connections between the photoreceptors each photoreceptors is synapsing with two types of bipolar cells on center and off center while the bipolar on is going to transmit the signal to the ganglion cell on center and the bipolar cell of center is synapsing or transmitting their activity to the ganglion cell of center that is the shape of synapse or the different types of the retinal cells and how we are going to transform the signals through the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells to reach to the cerebral cortex that is what we are going to discuss in details The receptive field of a bipolar cell and ganglion cells consists of two parts, the receptive field center and the receptive field surround. The photoreceptors located in the receptive field center are usually producing direct or transmit the signals directly to the bipolar cells while the receptive field or the photoreceptors located in the receptive field surround are going to deliver the impulses or the signals to the bipolar cells through or via the horizontal cells so we have to understand this clearly that is the photoreceptors that located in the center or in the surround are going to change the activity of bipolar cells and ganglion cells the center photoreceptors or the photoreceptors located in the center of the receptive field are directly activating the bipolar cells and ganglion cells this is known as direct pathway direct pathway and the photoreceptors located in the receptive field surround are affecting the bipolar cells by the indirect pathway through the horizontal cells that is the difference and usually the change in the membrane potential of a bipolar cell to a light stimulus upon the receptive field center and the surround are opposite for example here the presence of light in the center of the receptive field cause hyperpolarization of the photoreceptors and consequently depolarization of the bipolar cells while if we have the light here in the surround the light here in the surround of the receptive field will cause stimulation of the photoreceptors and hyperpolarization of these photoreceptors hyperpolarization of this photoreceptors located in the surround or in the part of the receptive field surround is going to produce hyperpolarization of the bipolar cells through the horizontal cells so the light in the surround is going to produce hyperpolarization of the bipolar cells and in this change of the rate of the charge with depolarization and hyperpolarization the impulses or the visual signals will be carried by the ganglion cells so when the bipolar cell is depolarized and consequently the ganglion cells the brain will inform that we have a center or a light in the center of the receptive field while if the bipolar cells are hyperpolarized and consequently the ganglion cells this means that we have dark in the center and light in the surround again we would like to define the receptive field the receptive field of a bipolar cells and the ganglion cells is a circular area in the retina a circular area in the retina that when stimulated by light stimulus change the membrane potential of both cells change the membrane potential of both cells if the light is present in the center this causes depolarization of both bipolar cells and the ganglion cells if the light is present in the surround this will produce something which is called the hyperpolarization of bipolar cells and ganglion cells so we can conclude that the response of the bipolar cells to light in the center in the receptive field is opposite to the response if the light is present in the surround of the receptive field here there is depolarization in response to hyperpolarization of the photoreceptors of the center in the receptive field light or light in the receptive field center light in the receptive field surround is going to produce what hyperpolarization is going to produce hyperpolarization of the bipolar cells 
and if we go to the ganglion cell receptive field usually the ganglion cells inherits the same receptive field of the bipolar cells that is formed of center and surround so we usually have on center and off center ganglion cells that receives input from the corresponding types of bipolar cells this means that we have on center and off center on center of the bipolar cells that stimulated when there is light in the center of the receptive field and there is off center ganglion cells and bipolar cells that's showing hyperpolarization when there is light in the uh, surround of the receptive field usually the response of the ganglion cells is making action potential or generating action potential and the response of the ganglion cells to light in the center or in the surround of the receptive field by increasing or decreasing the firing rate by increasing or decreasing in the firing rate so for example if we have here light in the receptive field center depolarizing the bipolar cells this will be associated with increase in the firing of the ganglion cells while we have hyperpolarization of the bipolar cells consequently decrease in the firing of action potential from the ganglion cells decreasing the firing of action potential from the ganglion cells types of bipolar cells and ganglion cells in response to light focusing or a flash of light on the retina they found that group of the ganglion cells show increase in the rate of the charge while another group of bipolar of ganglion cells show a decrease in the rate of the charge so we have two types of ganglion cells showing two different responses to light one is named as on center ganglion cell and the second one is named as off center ganglion cells and this allow us to differentiate two types of bipolar cells the on center bipolar cell that depolarize in response to light and we have the off center bipolar cell that hyperpolarize in response to light and this arrangement provide a special processing a special processing of the visual input derived from the photoreceptor cells the center and surround arrangement of ganglion cells provide or the arrangement of these types of ganglion cells in the receptive field make these neurons particularly sensitive to luminance contrast to luminance contrast and this also uh, relatively insensitive to overall level of illumination this means that the photoreceptors can detect the minor change of illumination can detect the minor change of illumination it also allows the retina to adapt such that it can respond effectively over the enormous range of illumination intensities in the world so the retina can respond effectively over the enormous range of illumination this means that the arrangement and the presence of two types of the ganglion cells and bipolar cells making our retina highly sensitive to the minor change in the light intensity the minor change in the light intensity can be detected easily by the retina receptive field of bipolar cells we have here a photoreceptor synapsing or transmitting their signals to two types of bipolar cells we have off center and on center the difference in between the two types of bipolar cells is the glutamate receptors on or the bipolar cell of center contains AMBA receptors which is ionotropic receptors when glutamate bind to these receptors was going there is depolarization so usually we consider this type of bipolar cell as the cyan conserving as the cyan conserving what's the meaning of the cyan conserving the change occurring in the photoreceptors is the same is going to occur in the bipolar cell of center when this photoreceptor is depolarized in the presence of dark this bipolar cell is also showing depolarization on the other hand we have another type of 
receptors located on the on center bipolar cells and this type of receptors are metabotropic receptors are metabotropic receptors these receptors are known as m glu 6 receptors m glu 6 receptors and if we look to these receptors these receptors make the bipolar cell of the on center as something called sign inverting sign inverting what's the meaning of that the change in the bipolar cells is you is usually opposite to what happened in the photoreceptors so the m glue receptors metabotropic receptors present on the on center bipolar cells amber receptors located in the cell membrane of the off-center bipolar cells. So, in case of dark, there is depolarization of the photoreceptors, release of glutamate, depolarization of the off-center, and hyperpolarization of the on-center bipolar cells. In case of the presence of light, stimulation of the photoreceptors or striking of the photoreceptors by light, is going to produce hyperpolarization of the photoreceptor consequently hyperpolarization of the off center bipolar cells and depolarization of the on center bipolar cells if we look to the two situations in the presence of dark in the center of the receptive field and light in the surround of the receptive field this photoreceptor show depolarization, release of glutamate. Glutamate is going to excite the off-center bipolar cells, and they are showing depolarization. This will produce firing and activation or depolarization of the off-center ganglion cells. On the other hand, the on bipolar cells or the bipolar cells of the on center showing hyperpolarization and the firing of the on center ganglion cell is also decreased. So the cerebral cortex or the visual cortex is receiving information from what? From the two ganglion cells. The off center show depolarization and the on center showing or showing or producing hyperpolarization. So in this situation, the cerebral cortex will denote that there is no light affecting this photoreceptors. While if the photoreceptor is stimulated by light and this will produce hyperpolarization, decreasing the release of glutamate, the off-center bipolar cells and the off-center ganglion cells showing hyperpolarization and the on-center bipolar cells and consequently the on-center ganglion cells are showing increase in the rate of the charge or depolarization and the action potential will be generated. These impulses will be delivered to the cerebral cortex and the cerebral cortex will denote at this time that is what? That is stimulation of the center photoreceptors or the photoreceptors located in the center of the, this receptive field in a stimulation of the photoreceptors located in the center of the receptive field. When the center of the receptive field is dark and the surround is light, we have depolarization of the photoreceptors, release of glutamate. What is the action of glutamate on the m glu 6 receptors? Glutamate is usually produce inhibition, inhibition of this neuron. Why? Because there is inactivation of a certain type of cyclic GMB gated sodium channels. The binding of glutamate to the m glu 6 receptors is producing a decrease in the permeability of the membrane of the type of, of this type of bipolar cells to sodium by blocking a certain type of cyclic gmb gated sodium channels this will decrease the sodium influx accumulation of sodium outside produce hyperpolarization and with hyperpolarization there is decrease in the release of glutamate also and some other neurotransmitter but the most prominent is glutamate when glutamate is decreased or inhibited we have also there is decrease in the firing of the on center ganglion cell so hyperpolarization of the on center bipolar cells result in a decrease in the release of the transmitter which in turn result in a decrease of the firing of the corresponding on center ganglion cell this will result in a decrease in the firing of the corresponding on center ganglion cell 
while the glutamate released the glutamate released from the photoreceptor terminal is going to stimulate the amber receptors producing what sodium influx and this will produce depolarization of the of center bipolar cells increasing the release of glutamate to activate the ganglion cell of the off center and this will increase the firing of the corresponding off center ganglion cell so with increase the release of glutamate from the off center bipolar cell there is increase in the firing there is increase in the firing of the off center ganglion cells of the off center ganglion cells so usually the neurotransmitter that is located that is located between the bipolar cells and ganglion cell is also glutamate is also glutamate and if we look to the type of receptors of glutamate on the ganglion cell they have several types of receptors but the most prominent is the amber receptors and lambda receptors glutamate has excitatory new excitatory receptors on both types of ganglion cells both types of ganglion cells have excitatory AMBA and NAMDA receptors. AMBA and NAMDA receptors. Presence of light in the center of the receptive field, hyperpolarizing the photoreceptor, consequently hyperpolarizing of the or of the off-center bipolar cells. And this will decrease the release of glutamate. This will decrease the firing from the off-center ganglion cell. And at the same time, the on-center bipolar cell depolarized due to activation of the cyclic GMP gated ion channel. This depolarization will increase the glutamate. Glutamate will bind to its excitatory receptor located on the on-center ganglion cell. These receptors, as we mentioned, are AMBA receptors and NAMDA receptor. And this will increase the firing from this type of ganglion cell or the firing from the on-center ganglion cell. So, in presence of light in the center of the receptive field, the ganglion cell of the on-center type or the on-center ganglion cell increase the rate of the charge or show increase in the rate of firing of impulses with decrease of the firing of impulses from the off-center ganglion cells. There is a question appearing in front of me now and this question is what is the significance of having two types of bipolar cells and two types of ganglion cells and the significance or the answer of this question is that the level of illumination we are exposed is not the same we have exposure to different degrees of illumination or different degrees of light intensities and to produce something which is called the comparison or the detection of the different types of uh, illumination or different types of light intensities we need these types of receptors and we need these types of bipolar cells and ganglion cells but before going to explain this in detail we have to understand the function of horizontal cells as we know, the output of the horizontal cells is mainly inhibitory or it produces lateral inhibition as any lateral inhibition mechanism recorded in the central nervous system. The lateral inhibition is providing what's called the proper or ensure the transmission of visual pattern with proper visual contrast, the focusing of the response. So in the visual pathway, the connections of the horizontal cells between the photoreceptors and bipolar cells helping to ensure the transmission of the visual patterns with proper visual contrast. It limits the excitation signals spread widely in the retina because of the spreading dendritic axonal tree in the outer plexiform layers. And the transmission through the horizontal cells puts a stop this to this by providing lateral inhibition in the surrounding area and as I usually say the lateral inhibition produce focusing of the response focusing of the response and this is essential to allow high visual accuracy in transmitting contrast borders in the visual image essential to allow high visual accuracy in transmitting contrast borders in the visual image
if I am asking you now, what do you see in this picture? Is it clear? Can you detect the type of animal or the what is present in the background? Okay, that is the shape if we don't have the horizontal cells. And that is the shape if we have the horizontal cells. The detection of contours and the edges or the outlines of the objects is the function of the lateral inhibition. Lateral inhibition is important to or in enhancing the neural representation of edges where the light intensity change sharply and indicate a presence of contours, shapes, or objects. That is the function of the lateral inhibition helps you to detect the edges, help you to detect the contour or the shapes of the objects. Absence of light in the receptive field, either in the center or the surround, produce basal or spontaneous activation of both types of ganglion cells. The on-center and off-center ganglion cells both are showing a spontaneous activity or a spontaneous degree of activity. The dark center or the presence of darkness in the center depolarize the photoreceptors, consequently depolarize the off-center bipolar cells, increasing the fire from the off-center ganglion cells. And if you remember, we have direct synapse or the receptive field center photoreceptor transmit their activity directly to the bipolar cells, while the photoreceptors in the surround is going to modify the activity of the bipolar cells indirectly through the horizontal cells. So, if we go and magnify more or look more in about the detail, the center is dark and the surround is light. What's going? We have different degrees of illumination. We have darkness in the center and light in the surround. This photoreceptor is hyperpolarized. And when it's hyperpolarized, what's going? They are going to decrease the release of glutamate. The glutamate release will decrease. And this will produce what? This will decrease the release of GABA from the horizontal cells. Decrease the activity of the horizontal cells. When there is decrease in the release of glutamate, this will be associated with decrease in the activity of the horizontal cells. And usually the horizontal cells are secreting or releasing an inhibitory neurotransmitter, which is GABA. So with the absence of GABA, this off-center bipolar cells showing more depolarization and more release of glutamate affecting the off-center ganglion cells and increasing the fire from this ganglion cell. So what is going? The horizontal here, the horizontal cells here produce something which is called magnification of the response, increasing the activity of the off-center bipolar cells. This will allow this off-center ganglion cells to produce depolarization and stimulation of the visual cortex. And as we can see, the cerebral cortex is going to identify there is two types of illumination. There is darkness in the center and the light in the surround. So the horizontal cells here magnify the response of the off-center bipolar cells. Recording of the activity of the on-center ganglion cells and off-center ganglion cells when there is a beam of light in the surround of the receptive field. This will be associated with decrease in the activity of the on-center ganglion cells due to hyperpolarization of the on-center bipolar cells, while the off-center ganglion cell activity increase due to depolarization of the off-center bipolar cells. If the surround of the receptive field becomes maximally illuminated, the rate of the charge or there is maximum inhibition of the on-center ganglion cells with maximum stimulation of the of center ganglion cells. According to the rate of the charge and the rate of firing coming from the on center and off center ganglion cells, our cerebral cortex can denote the different levels of illumination and differentiate between the different types of lights with different intensities.
if we remember this situation when we have light in the center of the receptive field and the surround is dark hyperpolarization of the photoreceptor will be associated with hyperpolarization of the bipolar cell of the off center and decrease the rate of firing from the off center ganglion cells while the on center bipolar cells and on center ganglion cells are showing depolarization let us look here how can the horizontal cells is going to affect the bipolar cells and as we know from the previous the center photoreceptors or the photoreceptor of the center of the receptive field affect the activity of the bipolar cells directly while the photoreceptors of the surround of the receptive field is affecting the bipolar cell activity via the horizontal cells we have here light so as we mentioned with the presence of light here hyperpolarization of this type of photoreceptors consequently depolarization of the on center bipolar cells and hyperpolarization of the off center bipolar cells the horizontal cells in this situation is going to increase the inhibition of this type of bipolar cells why or how the surround is dark this means that this receptor is depolarized releasing glutamate and the effect of glutamate on the horizontal cell is excitatory this means the, glutam the glutamate excites the horizontal cells that is going to increase GABA release or produce more secretion or release of GABA and the gamma amino butyric acid will produce more inhibition more inhibition of the off center bipolar cells it will be more hyperpolarized and this will decrease the firing from the off center ganglion cells decrease the firing from the off center ganglion cells the presence of light in the center of the receptive field produce increase in the activity of the on center ganglion cells with subsequent or with decrease in the activity of the off center ganglion cells or on the other hand when the center become maximally illuminated there is maximum stimulation and maximum surcharge from the on center ganglion cells and the maximum inhibition of the off center ganglion cells so this denotes or allow the brain to identify between the different types of illumination and if this illumination is present in the center by a certain degree or if the center is maximally illuminated the rate of the charge of the ganglion cells is variable and this will help in identifying the luminance contrast or providing something which is called the luminance contrast what's the meaning of the luminance contrast it is the ability of the cerebral cortex to detect the minute differences in the level of illumination the ability of the cerebral cortex to identify according to the rate of the charge from the ganglion cells can detect the minute changes in the degree of illumination the minute changes in the degree of illumination if there is no light in the center or in the surround of the receptive field we have the on center ganglion cells show spontaneous activity beam of light enter in the surround this is associated with hyperpolarization of the on center ganglion cells and decrease in their activity while if there is maximum illumination in the surround of the receptive field there is maximum inhibition of the on center ganglion cells the presence of light in the center of the receptive field the on center ganglion cell show increase in their activity when the center becomes maximally illuminated they will be associated with increase in the on center ganglion cells or maximum stimulation of the on center ganglion cells when the light is affecting both the center and the surround the center and surround we will find that the, the charge is just above the baseline because center effect is higher than the surround because the center effect is higher than the surround so we will find that the activity is slightly above the baseline slightly above the baseline that is the response of the on center ganglion cells to the presence of illumination or presence of light either outside the receptive field here or 
in the surround of the receptive field or the stimulation of the center of the receptive field or stimulation of both the center and surround. The response of the off-center ganglion cells when there is no light in the receptive field, either center or surround, there is spontaneous activity. Presence of light in the surround increases the activity of the off-center ganglion cells. Presence of maximum illumination in the surround of the receptive field produces maximal stimulation of the off-center ganglion cells. When there is a slight beam of light in the center of the receptive field, there is inhibition of the off-center ganglion cells. When there is maximum stimulation or maximum illumination present in the center of the receptive field, there is maximum inhibition of the off-center ganglion cells. The illumination in both the center and the surround is associated with increase or slight increase in the activity of the ganglion or the off-center ganglion cells. The presence of two types of bipolar cells and consequently two types of ganglion cells that take the impulses or take the stimulation from the photoreceptor allow the cerebral cortex to find the minute differences between the types of lights or the degrees of illumination between the different intensities of light. After we studied the different types of ganglion cells as the on-center and off-center ganglion cells and the change in their rate of the charge in response to the presence of light in the center or in the surround of the receptive field. Now we are going to look for the structural or the different types of the ganglion cells in relation to their structure. We have two main types of ganglion cells large magnocellular ganglion cells or named as M cells these M ganglion cells or the magnocellular are characterized by the large cell bodies large cell bodies and more extensive dendritic field more extensive dendritic field and large diameter axon large diameter axon again the magnocellular neurons are characterized by larger cell bodies, more extensive dendritic field, and the large diameter axons. And they usually carry information or receive information about movement, location, depth perception, and they are characterized by Fast conduction and larger visual field perception. They are characterized by fast conduction and larger visual field perception. While the second type or the small parvicellular ganglion cells is responsible for detection of color, form, and texture of objects in the visual field. They are transmitting signals that inform the brain about color form texture of objects in the visual field we have a specific type of ganglion cells named as photosensitive ganglion cell and they contain a specific photopigment a specific photopigment known as melanopsin known as melanopsin and this type of photopigment make them respond directly to light even in the absence of rods and cones even in the absence of rods and cones and they project or they send most of their impulses to the suprachiasmatic nucleus to the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus via the retinohypothalamic tract via the retinohypothalamic tract and the significance of this type of photosensitive ganglion cells is the maintenance of the circadian rhythm the maintenance of the circadian rhythm so with the perception of light and the stimulation of this type of ganglion cells this will stimulate the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus that is responsible for the day night cycles or the activity or the circadian rhythm cycles
ganglion cells and optic nerve fibers ganglion cells and optic nerve fibers each retina contain about 120 million rods and 6 million cones and the number of ganglion cells is about 1.6 million thus an average of 60 rods and 2 cones converge on each ganglion cell and optic nerve fiber leading to the brain leading to the brain at the center of the retina we have the fovea centralis the fovea centralis which contain about 35,000 cones and no roads 35,000 cones and no roads and the number of the optic nerve fiber leading from this part of the retina is almost exactly equal to the number of cones this means there is no convergence this means one cone to one bipolar cells to one ganglion cells but in the periphery of the retina either from the temporal side or the nasal side we have convergence that may reach up to 300 rods that going to converge on one single optic nerve fiber or converging onto a one ganglion cell another anatomical feature another anatomical feature of the fovea of the fovea that the displacement the displacement of the inner layers of the retina the displacement of the inner layers of the retina so the photons of light are going to be hitting the photoreceptors directly or going to hit the cones directly without being dispersed by the inner layers of the retina by the inner layers of the retina so that is the fovea centralis another feature is the absence of blood vessels the blood vessels or the area of the fovea is devoid of blood vessels and it's mainly depend on the nutrition coming from the choroid the diffusion of oxygen and the nutrients from the choroid retinal projection to the subcortical regions of the brain Normally, the pathway or the visual pathway starts from the retina to the optic nerve, optic chiasm, optic tract, where it mainly terminates in the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. While some of the optic tract fibers pass to the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus to control the circadian rhythm, others go to the pretectal nucleus to the pretectal nucleus in order to initiate the papillary light reflex by stimulating the edinger westphal nucleus on both sides others go to the superior colliculus and the superior colliculus is known to produce rapid directional eye movement and head movement producing controlling of the head movement and the eye movement in response to the visual stimuli in response to the visual stimuli the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus it relays the visual information from the optic tract to the visual cortex through the optic radiation it also control the intensity of signals transmitted to the visual cortex it has a gating function through number one corticofugal inhibitory impulses from the visual cortex there is a reverberating circuit that is present between the cerebral cortex and the thalamus we have inhibitory fibers coming from the visual cortex to transmit the transmission of the signals at the level of the thalamus so the visual cortex send inhibitory impulses to the thalamus at the lateral geniculate nucleus to inhibit the transmission of the signals also it receives signals from the reticular areas of the mesenchymal from the reticular areas of the mesenchymal the human lateral geniculate body showing the magnocellular barbicellular and coniocellular layers we have magnocellular layers and the barbicellular layers and in between we have another type of layer which is called coniocellular layers 
كونيو سيلولار لايرز ريسيف انبوت فروم ذا نون ام اند نون بي بايبس اوف ذا ريتينال جانجليون سيلز فروم ذا نون ام اند نون بي بايبس اوف ذا ريتينال جانجليون سيلز سو ذا ستراكشر اوف ذا لاترال جينيكليت بودي ات از فورمد اوف 6 لايرز 2 ماجنو سيلولار لايرز اند 4 بارفي سيلولار لايرز اند ان بتوين وي هاف كونيو سيلولار لايرز function as a relay station to transmit the impulses from the optic tract to the visual cortex it also control the intensity of signals transmitted to the visual cortex through the corticofugal inhibitory impulses from the visual cortex the reticular areas of the mesenchymal it controls by impulses coming from the corticofugal inhibitory impulses from the visual cortex and the reticular areas of the mesenchymal Magno cellular layers are present mainly in layer 1 and 2 receive their input almost from the M retinal ganglion cells or the magno cellular ganglion cells it provides rapidly conducting pathway to the visual cortex this system is color blind it transmits only black and white information it is essential for the detection of movement depth and flicker its damage has little effect on the visual acuity its damage has little effect on the visual acuity and the color vision but reduces the ability to perceive rapidly moving stimuli it reduces the ability to in perceiving the rapidly moving stimuli so the damage of the magno cellular layers has no effect on the visual acuity and the color vision but it reduces the ability to detect or perceive the rapidly moving stimuli while the barbi cellular layers between layer to layer 6 their neurons receives input from the barbi cellular ganglion cells that transmit color texture shape and fine details color texture shape and fine details this means that it is responsible for the addiction or the visual acuity it conveys accurate point to point spatial information but only um, at a moderate velocity of conduction with a moderate velocity of conduction rather than high velocity Damage of the barbi cellular layers has no effect on motion perception but impairs visual acuity and color vision. Impairs visual acuity and color vision. Layers of the lateral geniculate body. As we studied, the lateral geniculate body is formed of six layers and we have layer 1 and 2 are magnocellular layer 3 to 6 are layer of barbi cellular neurons the retina or the right nasal retina and the left temporal retina usually form here the left optic tract and if we go here to the end of the left optic tract layer 2 3 and 5 layer 2 3 and 5 are receiving their impulses from the ipsilateral or from the lateral half of the ipsilateral retina or from the temporal half of the of the left retina from the temporal half of the left retina or of the ipsilateral retina while layer 1 4 and 6 layers 1 4 and 6 are the site of termination of the fibers coming from the contralateral from the contralateral nasal retina from the contralateral nasal retina so we have six layers magnocellular one and two barbicellular from layer three to layer six layer two three and five are receiving from the ipsilateral side which type which temporal retina and layer one four and six are receiving signals from the contralateral nasal retina from the contralateral nasal retina visual cortex the primary visual cortex sight it surrounds the calcarine fissure on the occipital loop its neurons are arranged in the form of columns one by one by two millimeter forming six different layers forming six different layers and if we would like to the see the representation of the retina in area 17 the peripheral part is represented in the anterior part of the retina so the peripheral part of the retina are represented in the anterior part of the visual cortex 
the peripheral part of the retina is represented here in the anterior part of the occipital loop or of the visual area macula is represented in the posterior part the macula is represented in the posterior part upper part of the retina is represented above the calcarine fissure and the lower part of the retina is represented below the calcarine fissure and if we look to the functions of area 17 it produces perception of the visual sensation without understanding the meaning of the image perception of colors fusion of two image to produce the binocular vision perception of a changes in illumination perception of a changes in illumination so the function of area 17 is the perception of the visual sensation without understanding of the meaning perception of colors fusion of images to produce the binocular vision and the detection of the change in illumination layered structure of the primary visual cortex layered structure of the primary visual cortex the magnocellular pathway the magnocellular pathway terminates in the upper part of layer 4c alpha and the barbicellular pathway terminates in the lower part of the layer 4c as we see here the visual cortex is formed of six layers from layer 1 to layer 6 and if we look to the termination of the fibers coming from the lateral geniculate body the magnocellular neurons the magnocellular pathway for the black and the white vision without detection of colors and it is fast in conduction is usually terminating in layer 4 especially in c alpha especially in c alpha while the barbicellular pathway that is very accurate and can detect colors coming from the lateral geniculate body is going to terminate in layer 4c layer 4c beta layer 4c beta we have something which is called the plops or the color plops which are sections of the visual cortex where group of neurons and this group of neurons are rich in the mitochondrial enzyme cytochrome oxidase are rich in the mitochondrial enzyme cytochrome oxidase these plops or these types of neurons are sensitive to color and they assemble in a cylindrical shapes they assemble in cylindrical shapes damage of the barbicellular pathway leads to lack of acuity in shapes and the color lacks leads to lack of acuity in shapes and the color we have two types of cells are identified in the visual cortex by doing this experiment and putting this animal who is in a steady state and under anesthesia with open eyes and there is a screen in front of the animal and we implanted or we started to record the activity from the visual cortex we start to record the activity of the visual cortex so the animal is under anesthesia with open eyes and in front of a screen inserting electrodes in the visual cortex and recording the activity with the change in the position or change in the direction of this bars of this bars so we have bar of light and this bar of light is changing its orientation at different times we found that something very interesting as we know from the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells they have a circular receptive field and this circular receptive field is formed of a center and a surround the visual cortex is stimulated with the change or the presence of specific bars or edges or lines so if you look here when the bar in the horizontal direction there is no recording of the activity and with the start of the tilting there is start of the stimulation until it reach to be a vertical bar or the direction of this bar become vertically oriented there is maximum stimulation and with tilting again with tilting again of the uh, the, the, the bar or the uh, line there is decrease in the activation of the visual cortex this elaborates for us there are specific types of cells in the occipital cortex that prefer certain edges of different orientation that prefer different edges of different orientation and they are usually stimulated maximally with a specific or a preferred orientation they are stimulated maximally with the preferred orientation 
and if this orientation is changed there is no response of these cells for example here the vertical orientation produces the maximum stimulation of the cortical neurons we record its activity so this elaborate for us that we have two types of cells in the visual cortex simple cells that respond to bars of light or lines or edges but only when they have a particular orientation or preferred orientation so each cell or each group of cells in the occipital cortex are specific for detection of something like lines or light or bars but in a preferred orientation in a specific orientation and this can help us in detection is everything with edges or with bars like the tables like the uh, chairs like the TV everything with edges can be detected by specific type of cells and this can be stimulated when there is the they are present in the preferred orientation another type of cells present in the cortex called complex cells complex cells they resemble the simple cells or similar to the simple cells in requiring preferred orientation of a linear stimulus but are less dependent on location are less dependent on location of the stimulus they respond more to linear stimulus they respond more to linear stimulus moving laterally so they are preferring to be stimulated by the moved or the moving objects or the moving bars so without a change in orientation so the complex cells can detect the moving bars or the bars that move in the visual field without change in the orientation after we studied the primary visual area going to the secondary visual area that include area 18 and 19 the primary visual area is area 17 and as we move from the occipital loop towards the parietal loop or the temporal loop we have the secondary visual area so they lie in the occipital loop around the primary visual area and extend to the parietal and temporal loops area 18 is called also v2 and we have area 19 which is also present around it more distant secondary visual areas are assigned as v3 and v4 and so on if we look to the function of area 18 it is also known as the visual psychic area which is concerned with recognition of the nature of objects and correlates their colors interpretation of the visual sensation localization of the object in space or depth perception Area 19 it is also known as the occipital eye field area. It shares area 18 its function and control the different types of eyeball movement. It has a role in regulation of the different types of eyeball movements. Transmission of the visual signals from the primary visual cortex to the parietal and occipital and temporal loops. As we see here, the visual cortex receives the information and the processing or the transmission of the signals is depending upon its types. So the information related to form and the third dimensional detection or the motion are going to be processed and transmitted to the superior portion of the occipital loop and the posterior portion of the parietal loop. While the information regarding to the details and the colors the details and the colors are going to be processed and transmitted to the anteroventral portion of the occipital loop and the ventral portion of the posterior temporal loops the ventral portion of the posterior temporal loop so we have something which is called the transmission of signals to another areas in order to produce analysis and interpretation of the visual information analysis and interpretation of the visual information and this will provide us to something which is called what and where pathways what is the meaning of what and where pathways What is the meaning of what and where pathways? How can we detect the directions or the spatial orientation of uh, position or the detection of location while or how can we detect the objects? So we have something which is called what and where pathways. It describes two information processing stream originating in the occipital cortex. 
the projection from the secondary visual area to a higher areas in the cortex can be roughly divided according to two major parallel pathway. We have a ventral pathway going to the posterior region of the temporal loop that is essential for something which is called what pathway. It is responsible for the recognition of objects, recognition of faces, so it is projected from the V2 to the temporal loop, to the temporal loop, especially to the posterior part of the temporal loop. This is called the ventral pathway, ventral pathway. We have another pathway from V2 to the middle temporal area to the parietal loop. This is called the dorsal pathway, and that is responsible for the detection of wear, for the detection of wear. So we have two pathways coming from V2, one going from V2 to V4 to the posterior part of the temporal loop to detect the objects to produce object recognition that is called the what pathway and from V2 to the parietal loop that is called the dorsal pathway to inform or to identify the location or the spatial information. Lesion of the parietal cortex severely impair an animal's ability to distinguish objects on the basis of their position while having little effect on the ability to perform object recognition tasks he cannot identify the objects uh, independent dependent on the basis of their position in contrast lesion of the infrotemporal cortex produce profound impairment in the ability to perform recognition tasks there is deterioration of the ability to perform recognition tasks but no impairment in detection of the position, no impairment in spatial tasks. Lesions in the visual busway. The lesion in the optic nerve will produce by blindness of the corresponding eye and loss of the direct light reflex in the diseased eye. Loss of the direct light reflex in the blind eye. Lesion in the optic chiasm. If the lesion is present in the central lesion or in the central part of the optic chiasm, it will produce bitemporal hemianopia. Bitemporal hemianopia. While if the lesion is in the peripheral region, it will produce binasal hemianopia. Binasal hemianopia. So usually the lesion in the optic chiasm it is central as occurring with pituitary tumors or enlargement of the pituitary glands it will produce bitemporal hemianopia and intact light reflex from the temporal sides of the retina it will produce bitemporal hemianopia and intact light reflex from the temporal sides of the retina peripheral lesions will produce by nasal hemianopia and intact light reflex from the nasal sides of the retina lesion in the optic tract lesion in the optic tract will produce contralateral homonymous hemianopia contralateral homonymous hemianopia why due to injury of the same side temporal fibers and the opposite side nasal fibers in the optic tract so there is something called contralateral homonymous hemianopia the light reflex is lost from the blind sides of both retina then we have lesions in the lateral geniculate body and optic radiation it will produce contralateral homonymous hemianopia and intact light reflex intact light reflex but we have lesion in a specific part of the optic radiation that is passing through the temporal loop, temporal loop, which is called the Myers loop. It will produce superior homonymous quadrant anubia. Superior homonymous quadrant anubia. While if the fiber passing under the parietal loop is affected, it will produce inferior homonymous quadrant anubia. Inferior homonymous quadrant anubia. Lesion in the primary visual cortex lesion in the primary visual cortex will produce contralateral homonymous hemianopia with macular sparing and intact light reflex intact light reflex lesion in the secondary visual area produce visual agnosia visual agnosia or inability to understand the meaning of the visual sensation inability to understand the meaning of visual sensation